So the message that I want to share this morning is, is called God's Presence. And this came to me as I was um, studying God's presence through, um, I, I'm not going to go into it now, I'll, I'll explain it, but uh, as I saw similarities between the descriptions of, of God's uh, interaction with his people, uh, and I studied more and more, I found that there was just some, some very uh, powerful Some significance there for this. And so I, I just called this God's plan of redemption through his story. Uh, if I forget to... Helps if it's turned on. There we go. <laughs> so... In the uh, opening verse I want to use. It's found in Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. And it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how big a temple would be? And the, the train just just coming behind him and all around, just filled the place. Uh, what a what an amazing image that Isaiah had of the awesomeness of God as he's in his throne room. I can't even imagine what a blessing that would have been to, to have that to have that vision. Verse two above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with Two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So these, these creatures, right, are, are gathered around. We don't know of them being anywhere else. We never hear of them anywhere else except in the throne room of God. They seem to be created beings who, whose sole purpose was to worship God and bring him glory so that there was just a continuous lifting of praise in God's presence. That's so neat just to think that, that the... You know, we, we, many of us enjoy worship music and hymns and, and playing the Christian songs on the radio or what have you. And, and just imagine being in that atmosphere of praise and celebration of who God is just continuously. And the, the last verse there is really important. It says that the temple was filled with smoke. Okay. And this is one of the two key things that indicate God's presence, okay? So wherever God shows up, there's quite often smoke and flame or fire. And I want to show you a lot of uh, examples of that. So we're going to do a quick walkthrough, and I, I won't read all these verses, but uh, we'll take a... a a look and many of them will you'll remember anyway but the first is in Eden the garden okay and it talks about in Genesis 3 8 that they heard the, the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and how they spent time with the Lord uh, in his presence and walking with him in the garden and so they that was when man first enjoyed God's presence. The next example we see is with Abraham. And Abram uh, had a covenant with God, and God said, uh, I'm going to do all these things for you, Abram, and what I, what I want you to do as a, kind of a, a commitment to this on your behalf is 
cut up these animals and, and put them in the pathway with half on each side, okay? And I will pass between them. Well, what does that look like? <laughs> I would have been I would have been questioning that all day long as I was preparing this. And uh, God shows up in, in, with, a, with a torch and a smoking uh, fire pot, okay? And so with the smoke and the fire and the flame, God passes between the animals' halves. And they, they have an agreement. They have a covenant together uh, that they follow. Next is uh, Moses, right? Another significant character. And Moses runs away from Egypt. And there an angel of the Lord appears to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a, a burning bush, right? We know that story. And he has to do what? He has to take off his sandals, right? Because the place where he was standing was holy ground. So from a burning bush, you're going to have what? Two things. <laughs> fire with the burning and smoke from the fire. And that was God's presence in the bush. But the bush didn't burn up. Okay? If we set make a fire in the fireplace, the wood's going to burn up. There'll be uh, smoke and flame, but the, the wood will eventually exhaust itself. But not in this case, because it was God who was at work in this situation. And so Moses takes off his sandals and realizes, I am standing before God Almighty. And, and uh, this bush was uh, engulfed in flames. And um, God's presence met with Moses, and they had a verbal conversation. Just that, that would be neat, too. There's so many wonderful thoughts in these passages as we think about what it would be like to talk to God, to be in God's presence, to, to uh, see his throne room and, and the cherubim praising him, and what that, all these things would be like. Well, next we, uh, we see the, the Ten Commandments. Moses chisels out the tablets of stone, um, and uh, he, he climbed up Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him. So as God's presence met with Moses on the mountain uh, it was in the form of a cloud so another kind of a smoke cloud uh, example and that's Exodus 34 4 through 5 and actually I should put this slide first because uh, before they went up Mount Sinai they escaped from Egypt, and Pharaoh was chasing after them with his chariots, right? And how did they travel? How did they know where to go? You've got a million people in the desert all going in the same direction, or whatever number that you're, you, you, know, you're, you want to pick, but it was a lot of people. And God led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so a pillar was a common architectural piece, right, back then. We see it in Rome a lot. They have those, these big pillars that held up the, the roof of the uh, various buildings. And in this image, you can see the people following and this pillar of, of cloud. Uh, it was God leading them um, to safety. And at nighttime, that would have been uh, a pillar of fire. 
And so on Mount Sinai, again, we get a, a better uh, explanation here. Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And for six days, the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called for Moses from within the cloud. And to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire. That's right. So they're on the ground and they are scared to death because Moses went up on this mountain and it's, you know, fire and smoke and lightning and all this stuff. And Moses is in his glory, right? Here I am up here with camping on the mountaintop with God. This is amazing. And for them, they were like, this is the scariest thing we've ever seen in our lives. And uh, God shows up in all of this smoke and fire and cloud uh, as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed there in God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights. Good biblical number there. Now, this is uh, one of where it gets really interesting. So far, it's just been Sunday school, but this is, uh, this is going to get good here. In Exodus uh, 40, 34, they, they decide, well, you know, it would be really great if, if we had a place to go and worship God, a temple, right? And so if you're marching through the desert, it's kind of hard to build a temple, but they could build a tabernacle. And that's a fancy word for a tent uh, of worship, of meeting, okay? Uh, have you ever been to any of our Advent Christian camps? Anybody? Yeah, several of you have. Been to Alton Bay, been to Canic Falls, or some of these other places. What's always at the very center of the camp? The tabernacle, the tabernacle right? And we go there and we worship God there in that place, in the tabernacle. And around the tabernacle, we have buildings and cottages and the people that are there to camp for the week as they, as they come together. Uh, and <clears throat> they, they did this on purpose in our camps today because back in that time, they had all the tribes camped around this tent of meeting, this tabernacle. So it says the, the cloud covered this tabernacle, okay, this tent, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. I love how it says that a couple different times. Uh, just for emphasis and for meaning. Imagine you came to church here this morning, and you opened the front door and you, you couldn't get in. <laughs> because God's presence was so powerful in this building, in this place, that none of us could get through the door. That's what it was like. It, that they couldn't even come in, not even Moses, and, and be in this tent of meeting and meet with the Lord because of his, the power of his presence was there in an amazing way. Um, and so from that point forward, God's presence is with them. Um, from, they went from the pillar into the tabernacle. Imagine if you saw a cloud in the shape of a pillar. Every day you've been following it, and then it enters a, a building, basically. And now it's, it's, there's so much smoke and so much powerful presence that you can't even get through the doorway. And that was in 1450 B.C., Did I do that once or twice? There we go. Okay. 
So in 950 BC, uh, when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. So, who built the temple in Jerusalem? Solomon. Solomon. Good answer. <laughs> A lot of people say David. David wasn't allowed to build the temple because God said he, he wanted to, but David, but God said, David, you, you've got blood on your hands. You're a, you're a, a warrior. And so I'm going to choose your son uh, to build this temple. And so David collected a lot of the gold and the cedar and the, the things that would be used, but it was Solomon who built the temple. And so Solomon builds this beautiful uh, building of stone in, in the capital city of Jerusalem, right near the palace, and it's just fantastic. The, the riches of the world <laughs> were put into this building. And uh, uh, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing place. Uh, so this tent, tabernacle, was at a different location that I actually got to go and visit when I went to uh, Jerusalem, to Israel with uh, Bix. And that was... Uh, Quite a thing to see the the landscape and say they would, they had a sign. This is where the tent of meeting stood, and then they had all the tribes and showed where they were camped, north, south, east, and west. And to be able to be there in that place and say, this is this is it. <laughs> this is in the Old Testament. This is where the tabernacle was. And then later on to travel to Jerusalem and go into the city and say, this is where the tabernacle was, not, I mean the temple, uh, and see the, the uh, you know, even what's there now, it's not the same. It, it was, uh, would have been an amazing thing. And so the cloud of presence leaves the tabernacle, goes through the air, <laughs> and enters the temple. And again, the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Same thing, bunch of years later, and God shows up in a powerful way to kind of anoint and fill the place with his presence. Wow, what a neat thing to imagine God's awesome power and presence in uh, showing up in that way. So there's a number of uh, benefits that go with God's presence. Uh, you can follow these through the covenants with the different uh, people like Abram and Moses and David. They make uh, covenants with God and, and he makes promises to them. And having God's presence with you carries with it huge benefits, right? Uh, so we see the benefit of, of guidance, that God guided them as a, as a people. Uh, God made their name great. Israel was, uh, if, if you wanted to trade with Egypt and Rome, uh, or Babylon, Mesopotamia, Assyria, and any of the African countries, in Egypt, you either had to go across the desert or through Israel to get there. Okay? So Israel collected taxes. Right? They bought and sold. They had a very lucrative uh, work going on as they had you know, artisans and, and, and things that, that uh, people, for work, a lot of people had a lot of work. And so it made the king very, very wealthy. Uh, and, 
everyone knew of Israel because they would have to pass through there to get from one side of the Mediterranean to the other uh, at that point in time. And so God made their name great. They had a son of God relationship with him. Uh, he protected them from their enemies. He blessed them with rain, with good crops and wealth. And the covenants were fulfilled. Uh, this was a wonderful time when we read about David and Solomon and the wealth. Uh, Solomon asked for wisdom, but the Bible says he was the wealthiest man to ever live at that time. <laughs> Just tremendous blessings that God poured out on them. So, everything is wonderful, right? Until we get to that part in, about the kings. And uh, Ezekiel 10, 18 says, The glory of the Lord uh, then departed from over the threshold of the temple. So if you've read the, the Old Testament at all, you know that there's a section about the kings, and there's good kings and bad kings. And usually one follows the other. <laughs> um, and so the when there's a good king, they worship God and they give him praise and they tear down the, the, uh, the uh, places of, of evil and of uh, pagan worship and they direct uh, you know, the temple and, and get people focused on the Lord. Uh, but usually they were followed by a bad king who brought the people right back down again. So they went back and forth, and, and God tried to get them to follow him. And they kept doing their own thing. And so eventually God said, that's enough. That's enough. Uh, you know, I, I kind of wash my hands of you. I'm done with you because of your sinfulness, your disobedience, and your desire. And he, and he writes about a lot of this in the books of the prophets, how they would prostitute themselves with the other nations and, and, uh, and not look to the God who delivers them and provides for them. And so in Ezekiel 10, 18, it says, uh, do I have the right one? The glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple. So remember how God's presence was physically present in the temple? It's gone. God leaves the temple. And can you imagine the sense of loss if you cared? <laughs> there was probably a lot of people who didn't care. But for those that understood, God just left us. Can you imagine if God left you? Some of us have experienced heartache over someone we love leaving us, abandoning us. And uh, God just left his said, I'm, I'm through with you people. And he leaves them to their own devices. And shortly thereafter, here comes Assyria and Babylon and they conquer the people, they conquer Jerusalem, they tear down the temple to take all the gold out of it. Destroy them as a people and as a nation because God has left them. There's no more protection, there's no more blessing. And uh, so I just talked about this the temple is destroyed in 586 BC, and they, uh, they burned all the places and destroyed everything.
516. So men go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And they get permission from the king to do this. And he even helps fund it. And remember, um, that you know, God left. So it's yeah, there's there if they rebuild their temple they can worship God in their temple again because they were very much focused on worshiping in a specific place. But what's their other reason for wanting to rebuild the temple? Why would this be such a big priority for them that they would travel back and all the way from Babylon to accomplish this. Reconstruction. That's a lot of work. Maybe, just maybe, if we rebuild the temple and repent, God will come back. Right? If God comes back, he could indwell the temple once again and make things like they used to be. And that's how what they wanted. That's what they were looking for is a return to the good old days, the days of David and Solomon, when things were good and God was pouring out his blessing on us. We need that. Let's, let's fix the temple and, and, and accomplish that. But God does not return to his people. And 400 years of silence were a reminder to them of their sins and God's distance. And so for 400 years, no, no prophecies, no books being written, no movement of God, no God returning, no smoke and fire and all that. God is distant. But there is a promise that after the exile, God will bring Israel back to the land and multiply them. That he will make a new covenant that cannot be broken. That he will put his law in their hearts and give Israel a new heart and spirit. That he will cleanse and forgive their sin. That he will raise up a righteous Davidic king. And that he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Jerusalem and the temple will be rebuilt. And so the prop from the prophets 400 years ago, they had all these promises that they said, hey, you know, we, we believe that God is going to send a Messiah. And so they looked for him. Well, uh, you're already saying, you're sorry. Saying you're fine. After the exile. Jumping. All right, that's the that's the list I just shared. Thank you. And so they they looked for these things to be accomplished uh, because they wanted to uh, worship God and have Him bless them. And so Messiah does come and. He is known as Emmanuel, right? What's the meaning of that? God with us. Do you see the significance of that word? God with us. God was with them before all those times, the smoke and in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple. And that's what they longed for, was God to return and be with them once again. And now we have Emmanuel, God with us, in the flesh. And not just in a cloud or in a fire or mist. Not what they were expecting, but it's what the Lord provided. Yes. 
And so each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus does spend time in the temple, okay, uh, which is pretty neat. Two, yeah, house. I'm all, I'm all worried. I'm going to be on the wrong page. So, Acts two tells us that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. And again, when I went to Jerusalem with Vix, we went to the this place that they believed was the upper room. What a great experience that was to be in the same place that where the the spirit of the Lord fell on the believers, the disciples, and where, uh, what happens? <laughs> the place is filled with a, a rushing wind, okay? It's not exactly smoke, but it's it's got some of those, those same ideas of God's presence moving through a, a, a room uh, where it, the wind should not be blowing, okay? It's all closed up. And tongues of fire appear on their heads. And so the, the, the presence of God is in, is in that fire, is in, the pres is in, their, in, the, in amongst their presence. And he fills them with himself. <laughs> and uh, Peter goes out and preaches, and 2,000 people believe that day and are baptized. How awesome is that? So they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? And so he says, we're not going to have a temple that you have to go to in Jerusalem. We're not going to have one place where I dwell. But because uh, the uh, curtain was ripped in two, right, uh, I am now going to be made available to everyone who believes. I'm going to be poured out onto every believer through the Spirit. And... So you are God's temple, okay? Not just some building somewhere, but you, okay? Your body, your life is the, is the temple uh, where God and his spirit wants to live in you. And the significance of this, again, just like in the Old Testament, there was significance, there's huge significance here that... He's, he says in Luke 10, you'll have authority to trample snakes and scorpions and be able to overcome the evil one. So women, you don't have to run away from the mice and the snakes and the bats and all that because you will overcome those things. Um, and just like we will overcome the evil one. Uh, great promise there. Uh, we'll have authority over demons and diseases, authority to make disciples and to baptize. We'll have protection from the Lord and blessing. We'll have a future hope and guidance in decision making. So there's a few similarities, but there's some things that are really pertinent to today, to our situation now. And what wonderful Blessings that God wants to pour out on his people, those who believe in him today. Uh, so, the Holy Spirit is made available to every one of us who believes. And he's poured out on the, the saints of God, okay? And God gives us his spirit so that everywhere we go, we can represent him, right? And we are his ambassadors. 
We are, we are the temple of God in, in human form. He is Emmanuel, God with us, and he is with us through the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and alive and at, work, at work within each and every believer. And so we have this wonderful, wonderful promise. Think of that. The, the Spirit of God, that God himself who showed up for Abraham and Moses, who overcame Pharaoh and the chariots, who helped them cross the desert, who uh, wrote the Ten Commandments and filled the temple and the tabernacle with his presence in such a powerful way, who blessed the Israelites with David and Solomon and all the things that they accomplished and did and the victories in battle and the people that they were able to overcome and the, the great things they were able to do. The Bible says you will do all these things and even more. Amen? You are his people, his ambassadors, and he is at work in each one of us and wants to accomplish great things through his people called the church. And that's us, that's you and that's me. Um, but being the part of the church is so much more than just showing up on Sunday. It's so much more than just putting in our hour and making a little check mark next to the box. It's so much more than just saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian mentally. <laughs> Or, or uh, you know, on, on the, uh, what's that thing we fill out every few years? The uh, census, right? Uh, Christian. Uh, is, that all, is that all it means to you? Because uh, it's so much more. And God wants to use us so, in so many more ways, so, such powerful ways to be his witnesses, to accomplish great things in, in reaching this lost world for him. And so he didn't just pour out all these blessings on us just so we'd feel good. You know, pat a boy, pat on the back. It's so that he can see many in this world come to know him as the Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. And we have a great work to do in proclaiming this truth before Jesus comes back. And I don't think we have a lot of time. I don't know about you, but as I look at the world all around us, I see signs left, right, and center <laughs> that say this, this, this world is falling apart and Jesus is coming back. Uh, it's falling apart in one sense, but it's also uh, evangelizing around the world in other incredible ways. Um, and so we need to be a part of that. So with that word, I'm going to um, encourage you to... Live powerfully within the knowing that the Spirit of God is alive and at work inside of you. And uh, be bold in how you live out your faith and how you share it. Because these are going to be days that it's harder and harder to do that. And, uh, and I've gone way over, but I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Pray God's blessing on you as you uh, serve him this coming week.